I love skirmish games, and I love history. So when my friend J. Maxwell from Tempus Fugitives asked me if I wanted to look at a historical skirmish game he had been working on, I obviously said yes. A few days later, he sent me a copy of the rulebook for Force of Virtue, which I've been thumbing over and playing around with for a few months now. Although the rulebook makes it clear that you can use the rules for games set pretty much anywhere in the Renaissance, the first part of the rulebook focuses on 15th century Rome. If you know a little history, or you've been playing Assassin's Creed, you might know that Rome at this time was a bit of a mess. And this section gives a short introduction to the different neighborhoods and factions in the city. That really sets the tone for the game. But you're not here for information that any history book can give you, so let's talk about the game itself. First off, the game can be played on a 2x2 foot area, which I appreciate because I don't have the space for the traditional 6x8 gaming table at home. Each side will have 1 to 20 miniatures on the table, although 20 would be a pretty large game. Your force is represented by copy, or bosses, and troops. Most of the time you will be focusing on the copy, as the common troops will only activate when the copy order them to, and they will run away if the boss isn't around. Each unit is represented by a card, and at first glance there's quite a lot going on. My first impression was that this was going to be tricky to learn with all the different icons and stats here. Once you sit down and go through it, it's fairly straightforward, but do be warned that you will need a bucket of tokens and a few different colored dice to keep track of stuff. The first important stat you will need is the number of actions that this unit can do in a turn. Every turn, you can pick a capo who still has unused actions, and have them move, shoot, reload, rally, attack an enemy, or interact with an objective. In the case of move, shoot, and attack actions, you will then need to make a virtue rule, which brings us to one of the most interesting mechanics in this game. You know virtues are important because they're right there in the name of the game. Virtues come in for varieties, and they're based on the Renaissance ideals of the fighting men. Audacity, represented by a lion. Prudence, represented by a lynx holding a pair of dividers. Fortitude, represented by an elephant carrying a tower. And speed, represented by a very strange tiger holding an arrow. I think the artist making assets for this game were a lot kinder to the tiger than the artist who drew this back in the 15th century, but that's neither here nor there. Virtue rules all work in the same way, regardless of the action. You decide which virtues you want to use for the action, and how many points from each that you want to spend. Then you take that many dice and pick the best result. Let's say we want the pilgrim to move. We have four virtue points. One each for audacity and speed, and two for fortitude. We can mix and match them as we like, so I'll go ahead and use one speed and one fortitude. Yellow for speed, and purple for fortitude. It is important to distinguish which dice belong to which virtues, for reasons I'll explain later. In this case, our highest roll is 5, so that is the result of our virtue rule. Each action works with the result in a slightly different way, but for movement, you add half the result to 3, and you can move that many inches. There is a further limitation on spending virtue, and that is your fate score. In one round, you can only spend as many virtues as you have points in fate, so you're really dealing with 3 meta currencies in the game. Actions, Virtues, and Fate. In most cases, such as the Pilgrim, this will not be a problem, as he has 4 points of Fate and 4 Virtues anyway. In the case of other units, like Pedro from the tutorial, you need to be careful because you could spend 4 points of Virtue in a single action. And even if you would still have one left over, you would not be able to use it on another action, because it would exceed your Fate points. Now, you might be asking yourself why picking one Virtue over another would make any difference, other than the amount of points you get for each. There is a good reason for that, and I think it's one of the best features of the system, the criticals. If you roll a 6, you get a critical success. If you roll a 1, you get a critical failure. What happens depends on the virtue you are using, and the effects are extremely flavorful. For example, if you roll a critical success when moving with fortitude, it means you get any fortitude points you spent on the move back, and you don't expend fate for them. If you roll a critical when moving with prudence, you get a bonus to your defense until your next action. Just remember that no matter how many 6s you roll, you only get to choose one critical to apply. A critical fortitude failure on the other hand means that you only get to move 1 inch, while a critical prudence failure would mean that you have to move away from the enemy. There are different critical effects for movement, shooting and close combat, and they do enrich the game considerably. Using the virtue to execute the action already adds a lot of narrative flavor. Picture someone making a lightning fast attack versus a fighter who is plowing through his enemies with slow determination. But the mechanical differences in the critical successes and failures are really the cherry on the cake. 
the way this is used to handle close combat is pretty good in my opinion. First off, both attacker and the defender get to fight, and both of them get to choose what virtue to spend and how many points. The difference here is that they can split these dice between attack and defense, so each side potentially makes two rows. The target number to beat for both attack and defense is the unit's two hit number, so the pilgrim can cause damage or block a strike if he rolls a three or higher. If you succeed on an attack, you cause a hit, while if you succeed on a defense roll, you cancel one of your opponent's hits. However, critical successes on an attack can only be cancelled by critical success on the defense. If you do manage to land a hit, your opponent needs to roll an armor save. Failing this means that uh, they need to burn a virtue point. Burned virtues are not available for use, and do not reset at the end of the round. You can only get them back if you successfully make a rally action later. Finally, your opponent must make a wound save. If this fails, then the fighter is wounded and taken out of the game. You do have the last ditch option to burn a virtue to reroll the wound, but you really need to be careful as burned virtue can also take a fighter out. If a capo starts the round with all his virtues burned out, then he will flee the table. There is no initiative system in combat, so normally attacks happen simultaneously. You could have two fighters injuring or killing each other in the same exchange, which is a thing that did happen. However, if one fighter has a longer weapon, their hits are applied first. Let's say that a halberdier and a swordsman are in base to base contact. Both of them hit on the attack, and both of them fail the defense. Normally, this would mean that they both need to roll armor saves, but since the halberdier has a longer reach, his hit is applied first. If the swordsman fails both his armor save and his wound save, then the halberdier is perfectly safe. Since the halberd has a 1 inch range, the halberdier's player could also have chosen to initiate the attack from this distance. In this case, the swordsman's player would not be able to put any dice to attack, only to defend because the halberdier is out of the sword's range of 0. I think these rules model the fight well, with range and attrition having a significant effect. The critical hits are all of color. So far, we've only looked at the rules in the context of the copy because they're the only ones who can or directions. Troops can move, fight, and shoot, but only at the orders of a capo. They usually come in groups of three and have their own fate and actions, but do not have any virtue. They need to be in command range of a capo to do anything. They activate when the capo does, and they act as a group. Any virtue the capo spends also goes to the troops he's commanding. It does not cost any extra fate or virtue for the capo. However, the troops do expend their own fate and actions. And this is where tokens really come in useful, because the troops cannot receive more virtue in one round than they have fate, and they can't be ordered to do another direction if they have already used all of theirs. If you're moving, the entire group uses the same role to move, while in combat and shooting, each troop in a fight uses the same number of dice. There is a rule which I found rather difficult to keep track of, which is that if a capo doesn't take part in an action, he doesn't spend any of his own fate or his own action. For example, if a knight orders an arquebusier to shoot, but he is not shooting himself, the knight expends virtue but does not lose fate or an action. Only the arquebusier does. In the end, I dropped this rule because I kept forgetting about it. It does reduce the number of actions someone can take, but it's across the board so it's consistent. It also makes more sense to me that ordering troops around takes time. If a trooper is hit and fails the armor save, they burn a virtue point, just like the capo. However, since they have no virtue points of their own, the virtue point must come from a capo they are attached to. This means that as troops get beaten up, their leaders have a harder time getting them to work properly, which I like. One thing that works really well in this game is that the troops must be near a capo to operate at all. If a troop is outside a capo's command range, it will run away at the end of the round. This means it's uh, really important to keep your copy safe, but at the same time you can't leave them out of harm's way because command ranges are usually around 3 inches. This does a good job of modeling the conflicts of the setting, as most of the people involved are in heroes or champions. They are mercenaries looking for a payday. What I've given you so far is a brief overview of the rules. I didn't go in depth, and there's a bunch of other rule interactions besides, such as panic or charging into combat, but I figure there's enough there to give you a general feel for the game. By now you might be wondering how you put a force together, so let's talk about that. To build your force, you will need some card decks. Before a game, you agree with your opponent on the number of cards in your force. 5 to 10 is a good number. A warband can be built by selecting cards from up to 3 different decks. You don't pick them randomly, you can choose what to use. The cards themselves come in different categories. Logistics cards represent copy, troops, and equipment, 
and no more than half of your force can be made up of these cards. Quick note here, modifiers on the cards are based on the target number, not the dice roll, so if you're used to some of their systems, this might take a second to get used to. Virtue cards can be used to add virtue points to your copy, no surprise there. Intrigue, Honor and Strategy cards are pretty awesome. They're cards you can play that affect your enemies, your troops or the battlefield in general, and they make cool twists in the game. For example, Night Attack changes the rules so that the battle takes place in the dark, and Ill Discipline forces your opponent to start with unloaded ranged weapons. I like the general idea of these effects being part of the army building part of the game, as it says you build uh, some interesting strategies. That just about covers everything about the rules that I wanted to mention, so I just want to have a few words about the presentation of the whole thing. Overall, the rule book is well designed, though it does have a very narrow gutter. That means that you have to open it all the way to be able to read it properly, and that's not very good for the binding. Most of the rules are presented well, although some of the key elements could have been highlighted better. For example, the point about troops running away if they're out of command range is only explained in an example rather than in the main rules. The cards themselves feel a little cramped, and although I understand this was a design consideration to have a standardized aesthetic, I feel that having everything crammed up on the top in the logistics cards was a bit much. One thing that was outstanding in my opinion is the tutorial campaign. That's not part of the rulebook, but it is available for free on Master's Rogue Games. It does a great job of walking you through the uh, rules as you need them. If there is a future edition, I would love to see this included in the first part of the rulebook, maybe with references to the more complex rules as they come up. In my opinion, this would make the game much easier to get into for new players. The rulebook also includes a good scenario generator, which throws up a lot of variations and a well-defined campaign system, so there's a lot of scope for games beyond. Let's all walk over there and beat the crap out of the other guys. In the end, I think this is a great system, that is very engaging and a lot of fun to play. The rules represent Renaissance street fighting pretty well, and the strategies and the three cards add a lot of twists to the game. Because of the meta currencies, it might be a bit too much for newer gamers, but it's fairly easy to get it used to, and it plays beautifully. It's also squarely aimed at campaign play, which in my opinion every war game should be. Two thumbs up from me, but what do you think? Drop me a comment below if you've played this. If you want to have a look at Force of Virtue yourself, I left links to Tempest Fugitives and Master Stroke games in the description below. Down there you'll also find links to The Four Horsemen, my third years World Dark Fantasy supplement for Easy 6. I'll catch you around, but in the meantime you have a lovely week. Bye!